You know, people come to Sandals now and they think, oh, it's a big church and it's always been this way. And they don't realize, man, that it was always, you know, 50-50 whether we we're going to make it or not. The vision of, of, of our church was born in this house. What name is it going to be? Well, it's Sandals Church. What's our vision? It's, it's real, real with self, real with others, real with God. We never anticipated being here, looking back at how faithful God's been, how significant people have been. Lives have truly been changed at Sandals through relationships, through people walking alongside with people and changing them in community. That's what Sandals Vision is all about. It's about reaching people so that this real gospel, this story about becoming real with Jesus changes their lives. Hey, Saddles Church, man. Today is a super special day. It is our 25th anniversary as a church. Can you guys give it up? Incredible. Uh, so Tammy uh, informed me this week that I've been lying for 25 years. I know that's not probably shocking to many of you, but I've been telling people that I started this when I was 27, and she informed me this week that I was, in fact, 26. Uh, so here's what's weird is I was 26, you were 23. So think about that. I've been your pastor one year uh, less than I was alive when I started. She's been your pastor's wife two years more than she was alive when we started. And so you should have a lot of grace because we did not know what we were doing. Like, look at your average 23 and 25 year old and just say, could I follow them? <laughs> and if you're 23 or 25, would you follow yourself? That's all I'm saying. So. I think we need to have just a lot of grace. Uh, Sandals is a work of God, a miracle of God. But Tammy's joining me here today because I've asked her. And, uh, you know, if this thing blows up, it's my fault. So thank you for being here today. Yeah, appreciate it. So No, it's such an honor to be here today and join Matt for this message that marks 25 years of being different. Yeah. Um, this falls that milestone for us since we've planted Ch Sandals Church. And it's incredible just to think back about that it's been 25 years. So um, as we're in this series, specifically in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Yeah, there we go. Which say, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church forever and ever. Amen. Amen. As we're looking at 25 years of being different mm -hmm. and, and what that looks like and what we've learned along the way, how does this verse tie in with that? Yeah, so specifically, you know, when I read, when I read Ephesians 3, 20 and 21, right, now to him who is able to do far more than I could ever ask for or imagine, I had never heard of a multi-site church when we started. Um, I, that wasn't a concept. That was not a thing. I'd never heard of anyone even having a secondary campus. We have 14 campuses. And so um, the beauty of Sandals Church is, right, God has a plan for your life. He has a plan for my life. He has a plan for our church. And, and I just want you to know, it's, it's beyond even what you can imagine. You know, we're trying to figure out the future. God's already there. And he already understands that. And we were actually talking with a group of uh, pastors last week. It was bizarre, right? We're the old crotchety ones now. Um, and, you know, uh, all these church planters from around the world are like, tell us what it was like in the 90s, you know? I was like, well, we rode our horses to church. Um, but here's the thing is, you know, so when we started, mega church was the thing. Uh, and then, it, then it's become multi-site. And what I said, I told these individuals, I said, look, you, you think you're going to be multi-site. I said, whatever God has in the future, you don't even know what that is yet. And so oftentimes in the church, yesterday's solution is today's problem. And so we just have to really understand, God, wherever you want to take us, wh whatever you want to do with us, God, we want to go. And my prayer for you is that you just look at Sandals Church. This isn't about us. This is about what God's done through us. And this is about what God can do through you today. Because 25 years ago, we had three people come to church. You didn't even come. I was sick and sick kids. She didn't come. I, and I preached to three people. I can only remember one guy that was there. His name was Chris. He doesn't go to Sandals any longer. And in the middle of my sermon, he raised his hand. He had a question. Not about anything I was talking about. And, and here's the thing is, everything in me wanted to quit that day. Everything in me. 
You know, Tammy and I had shared with our pastor, and this is no slight on him. Uh, it's a difficult job, as, as, as I have discovered being a pastor and managing youth pastors. I love you. You're challenging. Um, <laughs> so we were youth pastors, so we were challenging. And, and I had a meeting with him where I expressed, you know, someday I want to plant a church, and so he let me go that day. Um, <laughs> So, so we were rushed into this, and you know, I think there was, there, was, there was some time where I was bitter and upset about that, but the truth is you need to immediately get after whatever God's calling you to do today. Mm -hmm. and, and if somebody hurts your feelings, wounds you to get you where you're supposed to be, to get you on track with God, let that go and get on with God. And, and that's what I would have said to us is, mm -hmm. you know, people are gonna be imperfect, they're gonna hurt your, your, your feelings, they're not gonna you know, handle your heart well, Forget about that. Start following Jesus. Get after that because that pain only leads to bitterness and, and bitterness is not going to lead you to the better path that God has. And so uh, when I read this verse now, it has such a different meaning. And so I would say this. Some of you are like, well, I'm too old. No, you're not. It, you're never too old to start working for eternity. So, so it's not too late. If you're breathing, God has a plan for you. And, and if you're too young, you're like, oh, I'm too young. No, no, look at us. Like we had no idea what yeah. what we were doing, how to do it. We made every mistake. I've always said, if I ever write a book on how to start a church, it will be how not mm -hmm. to start mm -hmm. a church. So many Christians are paralyzed because you're waiting for God to do something. So listen to me, you cannot do anything without God, but mm -hmm. God will not do anything great in you, your life without you. Mm -hmm. So you have to start moving. You have to, some of you are, you're praying for God to move. God is praying for you to move. Yeah. Do yeah. something. Do something with your life. And, and God has given you your life as a gift. Stop wasting it. You know, so many of us, we're on our phones watching everyone else's life. We, we go to the movies and we watch fake lives. Um, but God has a plan for your life. And in the midst of all this chaos, God wants to write you into his story as a hero. Mm -hmm. You play an essential part in this story and you need to jump into that. So let me say this, this is huge. God does not bless mediocrity. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I've encountered in 25 years is people are just kind of like, you're brilliant at work, you come to church, eh, that ticks me off. We should give God our very mm -hmm. best. The, the best Christians in the world today are not leading the church. They're, they're leading their own empires, their own companies. They're making money for themselves. And it's why the church is so backwards and broken. Listen to me, parents. I know you have plans for your kids. One of those knuckleheads needs to be the next pastor of our church. That's true. It we might be we your can't knucklehead. Do this forever. It might be your knucklehead. Uh, 25 years from now, it will not be us, okay? We, we're going to be in a rest home eating jello. So it's not, gonna, not wrong. It's not good. I mean, she's going to eat jello. I hate jello. She loves jello. Um, jello. She makes it every Thanksgiving. I never eat it. I can't stand it. You know, jello says we couldn't afford dessert. That's what that's that's what it says to me. That's just that's my that's my opinion. So here's the thing is. God does not bless mediocrity. And, and so many churches today, the reason they're shrinking, the reason we're not making a difference is we're just okay with the status quo. Man, if it, and I know there's gonna be people watching from other churches. This isn't about sandals. This is about what God could do at your church. And, and here's, here's our heart. It's not just to grow sandals church, it's to grow his church. We want to grow his church all across the world. We want to see uh, authentic believers changing a broken world. And, and, and so many people, you're just okay with okay. Why? Just ask God. What keeps me up at night is I always know, even as much as Sandals has done, I know there's more. I know there's more that God can do. I, I know there's more that God wants to say. I know there's more lost people that God wants to save. And, and, and I know I got to get out of that, get out of his way. And I just got to say, God, use me. So let me say this. God does not bless sin. He blesses mm -hmm. repentance. Mm -hmm. So I want to encourage you, man, if, you, if you're not living the life God has for you, stop today at the end of service, repent, go forward, ask for prayer and just say, you know what? I need to get on God's team. I need to, I need, I need to get with what he's doing. And, and we're going to talk about that. And so so again, I don't want this just to be about us. I want you to look at us and go, okay, that, that could be my story. Mm -hmm. And God may not call you to plant a church, but he has called you to his church. And here's the thing. 
Your role at Sandals is just as important as our role. Yes. You know people we don't know. You have gifts we don't have. Mm -hmm. God is going to give you a word he does not give to us. So quit asking God to bless you like he's blessed us and ask God to bless you like he wants to bless you mm -hmm. and be you. Now, that's so good, Matt. And you really spoke to God's part and how yeah. he meets us in that scripture. But the scripture is such a dance between what God has and the power within us and us. Mm -hmm. So how do you think this speaks to us in that? Like, what is our right. part in experiencing the truth of the scripture? Yeah. So I want you to really unpack, I mean, really spend some time this week in your community groups. I really unpack some, some thoughts, but here's the thing I want you to think about is when you unpack those questions, what's God's part in your life and what's your part in your life? Mm -hmm. God has given you a life to live. It's time for you to start living. God has given you a mind. It's time for you to start thinking. You, you are, I, I think sometimes Christians use God's in control as a crutch and an excuse for why their life sucks. God didn't create you for you to have a horrible life. Jesus said, I didn't come so you'd have a lame life. He said, I've come that you may have life and have it abundantly. Amen. Remember last week we talked about some of you in sin have wandered from the life that God has for you. Like there's God's life, God's plan, and then there's your life, there's your plan. And, and let me say this, I knew early on that I was called to be a pastor. So when I was in public education uh, in the 1980s, I know you're like, what was that? Um, they used to give you a, a test to discover what you were supposed to be. I kid you not, when I got my test results back, I didn't know what the word was. I'd never heard it before. This is at a public high school. The word was clergy. It sounds like a disease, right? <laughs> I didn't know what clergy was. And uh, my English teacher, Mrs. Brown, no relation to me, everyone you know is named Brown. Um, she just said, oh, sweetie, you should know what that is. That's what your dad does. And I was like, my dad's not clergy. He's a, he's a pastor, you know? Um, but, but even as a young man, God was working in my life. And, and I want everyone to listen to me. The more I ran from God's calling, the more painful my life uh, be, just, just unfolded into. I mean, my life just got worse. Uh, God's not going to get up, give up on you. and He's not going to let you go. And so here's the thing is what you have to, to do in order to truly be successful as a Christian, whether in business, in your marriage, in your life, as single, whatever it is, if you want the absolute best, okay, God, I, I want you to bless my life. You have to define success because here's the thing is success is your why. And the reason so many of you are miserable, I believe this, misery comes from a lack of clarity. You don't have your why. And if you don't have your why, you just don't know what to do. So we have a whole generation that's seeking to be happy. Happy is a result of you finding your why. Yes. Happy is not the why. Mm -hmm. And so when they chase happiness, man, they're miserable. And so, so I have to constantly define my, for myself, God, who have you called me to be? What have you called me to be? And even as your pastor over 25 years, I, I've watched... Pastors forget their why. Mm -hmm. They become more interested in Hollywood, politics. They get distracted by uh, fashion. I mean, I've seen all kinds of nutty stuff. I'm like, you're designing purses? What? <laughs> you know, uh, okay, you know? And these are, these are truly gifted, talented, amazing people that God has called. And so, you know, when Tammy and I sat down with HarperCollins uh, to sign my first book deal, I said, you guys need to understand, we're, we're pastors first. We were not changing that. We're not traveling around the world. We're, 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 we're going to pastor this church. And if, if you're not okay with that, then, you know, we're not interested. And I was surprised. You know, we were at the Mission Inn in, in Riverside, and they'd flown out to see us. And they were like, yeah, that's, what, that's actually what we want, which I thought was weird. But I said, okay. And they gave me a check, and we took it. So, you know. <laughs> but, but here's the thing is, the best blessings for your life will come from following God's will for your life. And you, and you have no idea. You have no idea. And um, so just really pray about, okay, God, what, what is the vision for my life? And so um, Tammy's going to really kind of help me unpack this for you, because I think this is key for all of you going forward and as we move forward as a church. It's been such an interesting season for Matt and I, just thinking about the 25 years, all that we've learned, and coming into a space where we're, we find ourselves with such gratitude for even the hardships, mm. because it's given us the fortitude to have the endurance, yeah. to keep on keeping on, to be here 
25 years later with Mm -hmm. one church. Mm -hmm. And so preparing for this message, you outlined seven goals that have been key to the success of the staying. So we're going to walk through those seven. Right. First goal is spiritual. Yeah. Why is that? Because God's, God's most important. And I know that sounds cliche, but most Christians forget that. God has to be number one. Um, so I don't care if you're, I don't care if you're professional, you're, you, you, you are building a business, you're, you're building your career, you're pursuing academics. God has to be number one because everything else is a terrible number one. It's a terrible number one. Nothing else is worth your time, effort, and energy. Nothing. Not your love life, not your sex life, not your financial life. If anything is number one, that God is way too small. And so, so I, I, I understood early on that when I had the wrong number one, my life was awful. Absolutely awful. And you got to date me for a period of that time. And so uh, that was good times. Yeah, it was, was, it was good great times. times. You know, we were talking with your mom. And this morning on the way to church, I, I, I told uh, your mom, I said, Tell Tammy I'm a great husband. And your mom said, Well, I had my doubts. Um, so uh, thank you for that, Kathy. Uh, we appreciate, appreciate your authenticity. Um, but, but here's the thing is what radically changed my life was God radically changed my life. It reprioritized it. It redirected it. Um, it really awakened me with vision. And, and here's the thing is, man, your life on your own is too small for you. But your life with God is bigger than anything you could ever ask for or imagine. Listen to what Paul is saying. Mm-hmm. There, there, there are things that, that you don't understand. There, there, are, there are tables that I'm seated around now where I used to watch these people on TV. Mm -hmm. And now they're asking me what I think. And I'm like. (laughs) And and Jesus said, listen to what he said. He said, if you follow me, you will testify before kings. Hmm. You will sit in the seats of power if you just trust me. If you follow your own power, you're just going to be miserable because you don't have a voice. Listen, if you feel unheard, start letting God speak through you. Because that's what people want to hear. Yeah. They don't care. Yeah. I know this is shocking. They don't care what I have to say. <laughs> people come to Sandals because I've chosen to let God speak through me. And people hear that and feel that and experience that. Mm-hmm. And, and, and so, so what that means for me, number one, I read my Bible every day. Every single day. I know some of you are concerned because I don't have it out here when I'm preaching. But here it is. I, I know some of my... We still can't read it. Yeah, I can't read course. it at all. But... Uh, <laughs> Well, actually, it says, it says Luke. I'm not even in Ephesians. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. That's why we have the big print out today. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm in the wrong book of the Bible. Here, do you want to use mine? Yeah. <laughs> do you remember one of my favorite uh, lines in, uh, um, oh, man, oh, shoot. What's the pirate movie, Disney? Pirates of the Caribbean. Well, pirate, when he's reading the Bible and he says, man, you got that upside down. <laughs> he's in the boat. That's how I feel right now. So at least, at least my book is right side up. But so, so I read through my Bible every day. And here's the thing. To speak for God, you need to be hearing from God. Mm-hmm. And, and you cannot speak from God unless you've heard from him. And so many, I hear this all the time from Christians. Well, I've never heard God speak through me. Why would he give you an audible word when you haven't listened to his written word? Mm-hmm. Every single day. And I learned I have to hold myself accountable. So if you read through my, uh, my Bible, you're going to see every single day when I read, I, I write the date in it because it holds me accountable because I know when I've skipped a day. I know when I've missed a day. And so I want to hear from God every single day. And it's amazing to me. I mean, you guys, I, I mean, Christian, although I read through the Bible, it's boring. Well, then you haven't read through the Bible um, because at first you read through the Bible for information, then you read through it through transformation. And then it's, it, it goes from becoming historical facts to everyday reality. And God starts speaking to you. And, and I can't tell you how many times I've just gotten a word for the Lord from my marriage, for my kids. So you need a word from God every day. And um, start with God's word. And don't be afraid to be a beginner. Mm-hmm. So many people are afraid to not know and not understand and there are some things that I had to read through 10 or 12 times over a period of a decade before I went, oh. Mm-hmm. And here's what I've learned. The answers I don't understand are the answers I'm not ready for yet. I'm just not ready. That's God's good. like, you know what? You know, That's the Apostle good. Paul says that. He said, I wish I could give you meat, but you're, you're ready for milk. He says, you're a baby. 
Um, and so if you're a baby in your faith, you know, expect baby food. It tastes gross, you know, and that's why you're like, Ugh. you know, it's, well, you need to grow up so God can actually feed you a steak. Um, so I, I hear from God every day through his word. Mm-hmm. I pray to God throughout the day. Mm-hmm. I'm constantly praying. When I wake up in the middle of the night, I'm, I, I'm praying. Prayer is not something that I do separate from my life. Mm-hmm. It's something that is integrated throughout my life. Mm-hmm. I probably repent. I mean, you know, probably. I mean, probably a lot. Yeah, probably a lot. <laughs> um, you know, a, a, a lot of what I talk to God about is just my sin. I'm like, Lord, I'm so sorry for that. That was terrible. That was awful. And, you know, I really believe in 1 John 1, 9. You know, when we confess our sins to God, he is faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I'd rather live clean. And so I just, oh, God, that was a dark thought. I'm so sorry. And I just confess it. And so, um, and then God starts to speak to me. You know, so that's the thing in conversation. I feel God. I hear God. I sense God. And then this is key. And some of you are going to, you're going to really struggle with this. If you want to find God's will for your life, you're going to find it by serving in his church. Mm -hmm. He does not have a plan B. There's no plan B. Mm -hmm. The church is plan A. It's the only plan. I know it's broken. I know it's messed up. Look at, you're a member. Amen, right? Look at you. We're all a mess. But in the midst of this mess, God is moving. God is working. And it's it's, it's absolutely beautiful thing. And so I found my life by serving the church. Whatever I got to do. And just so you guys know, you know, At some point, you know, for Tammy and I, we're not going to be leading here. Mm -hmm. It's our prayer to still be serving here. Mm -hmm. So, like, we went out to Palm Springs um, last week, and I thought we were getting murdered. Did you? I did send our team our location just in case they needed to come find us. I dropped that pin. (laughs) this random guy uh, through a friend of mine was like, hey, will you speak to a bunch of church planners in Palm Springs? And so I assume hotel, right? That's normal. Hotel. Okay, conference center, conference center, retreat, and we're center. driving through these like was it date fields, mm-hmm. in Palm Springs, and I'm On like, a dirt road. okay, the cartel <laughs> is out here. Um, we go through this private gate. The house has 13 bedrooms, just really freaky. I'm like, there are bodies buried in the yard, um, but uh, but we went out there, and we just for three and a half hours, four hours, mm-hmm. just talked to church planters, uh, prayed over pastors, and if you're a pastor who's who's listening, I know it's tough. And, and God's sheep have teeth. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> they bite. Um, but, you know, hang in there. And on the way out, they gave us a check. And she's like, you remember what you said? You're like, They're going to pay us? I was like, I, I don't know. Mm-hmm. And we don't do this. We don't do this because we get paid. Mm-hmm. We do this because we feel called. Mm-hmm. And you and I sat and we had dinner, um, had a great steak, Palm Springs. Thank you. You guys know how to cook. Um, and we just said, this is what we want to do with our life. Mm-hmm. We want to pour into the church. Mm-hmm. So if you're a married couple and you've had a hard marriage, why not take those stories and those experiences and pour into a young mm-hmm. couple? You know, if you're battling with same-sex attraction, why not mm-hmm. pour into a young LGBTQ plus person in our church and say, look, you can make it. I've made it. Mm-hmm. You know, well, you, you, see, you see families with two-year-olds. They're, t- they're terrorists, man. Pray for and come alongside our parents mm-hmm. who are... Are, are raising young kids in a world where everyone's looking at them. Mm-hmm. Nowadays, parents, parents are being you know, photographed and filmed from every angle and they feel all this pressure. Come alongside them, love them, mm-hmm. care for them. And, and here's the thing that you and I've learned is God has used our deepest wounds, mm-hmm. wounds to create the most incredible miracles. And we didn't know it in the moment. No. It just felt like a wound. Yeah. But in hindsight- Well, it was a wound. It was a wound. Yeah. It was not just a wound though. It was growth and opportunity yeah. and, and character building. And if we just continue to see it as just wounds, mm-hmm. then we miss out on what God has for us in yeah. that. Yeah, and don't be, a, don't be afraid to embrace suffering. Mm-hmm. Um, Jesus had to suffer on a cross, betrayed by his own friends, denied by his own family, uh, turned in by his own people. And, and he went, all of, went through all of that so that he could become the name that is above all names. And so part of the reason that you and I are who we are today is because we had to go through some really difficult things. And I prayed that God would take them away, and he didn't. He let us go through them, not because he hates us, but because he loves us. And so, um, so man, marry yourself to God every day. Marry yourself to him. 
Speaking of, younger me would have probably been pretty salty to not have been that number one goal. Yeah, I apologize. <laughs> um, 25 years later, me finds myself in conversations um, with our adult kids. Yeah. Telling, especially our daughters, who both were married this last year, here's what, here's why you don't want to be number one mm -hmm. in your person's life. Because you want them to love God more than you. Mm -hmm. Because when they do that, they would do right by you. Mm -hmm. Even when they're upset at you, don't feel in love with you. Mm -hmm. Because they want to be right with God mm -hmm. when they don't necessarily care about being right yeah. with you. Amen. Can you talk about why family is your second goal? Yeah. out of this list. I think I think when your your spouse is your number one or your kids are your number one, it puts too much pressure on them. So we went to see uh, Jordan Peterson this last week at the Fox Theater, mm -hmm. and um, his wife said something really interesting. Did you catch it? So Jordan Peterson sounds like a Christian. I, I don't think he is. Uh, I think he's wise and brilliant, but I don't think he's born again. But his wife said she was relieved when they had kids to no longer be his total focus. It's a lot of pressure when you're somebody one's when you're someone's everything, mm -hmm. and and n Tammy can't be my number one because she's not built for that. God alone can handle 100% of my my love, my energy, my time, my focus. That doesn't change God; it glorifies God. It will destroy her. This is why we fight on vacation because it's just like the two of us. Yeah, we're just staring at each other. There's okay. no work for people. Yeah. It's just like yeah. I need you to go to the gym. Yeah. 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 <laughs> So my wife is my number two, and um, and that's important because we drive ourselves crazy. You know, Tammy, Tammy's not always perfect. I'm not always perfect. God is always perfect, and so you know I, I need to make sure that I, I have him, you know, number one. And she's right after him. She's more important than you guys. I love you. She's more important than our kids, right? Like if our kids move out, I'm successful. Amen, parents. You know, if she moves out. <laughs> That's a failure. I, 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 that, that didn't go right. And so, so God is number one. My family is number two. But I want to talk about what that looks like, especially uh, for our husbands who are present, because I think it's so hard today to know what it means to be a husband and a spiritual leader. So what this means for me is I want to provide, as a husband, stability and safety in my home. And what I learned early on, young guys, is I was the greatest threat to that. So... Mm -hmm. When we first got married, I think I was like this, and you were more like this. I've become like this, and you've <laughs> become a little more like this. And so what, what I learned was my sole responsibility, spiritual leadership, begins with providing stability. I'm not leaving. I'm not destroying this family. I'm here. Um, and so, guys, that means we don't do stupid things financially. We don't relive our childhood when we're 40. You know, I always wanted to be a race car driver. Yeah, but... You're, you can't. Um, so, so I provide stability. And, and that is the sole role. So, so what is God? God is stable. He's the same today as he was yesterday, as he is tomorrow, as he is forever. And so part of being a spiritual leader in the home is being that constant thing. And it's one of the things that's so important for our kids and for our wives is to be stable. Okay? So I, I need to be there for her as she processes, as she feels, uh, as she, you know, talks about all the things she wants to do. I, I've got to be stable for her because one of the things I've noticed is when I'm like this, she's not okay. It really messes up my kids. It really messes up my, my wife. It messes up, it messes up our church. Mm -hmm. And so I've, I've got to find that. So when I'm like this, I go to my friends, I go to a counselor, I unpack that, and then I talk to her appropriately about, okay, here's what I'm feeling. But I don't just let it fly. Uh, you know, she doesn't get the rough draft. She gets. I mean, I have before. This is why he has yeah, this yeah. wisdom now 25 yeah. years yeah. later. Like, guys, if you ever say this to your wife, I'm just being real. That's, that's wrong. <laughs> that's wrong. Um, next, I think for our kids, um, I want them to know more than anything that, that they're loved. Um, you know, all three of my kids are so unique and so different. I want them to grow up in a loving home. And, and, and if you're a Christian father, your father in heaven loves you. Your kids need to know that you love them. Mm -hmm. Say it, say it, say it, say it. I love you. I love you. I'm proud of you. And if you're, you know, you're like, well, I'm not proud of them. We'll find something to be proud of, you know, because they're doing something good and speak into that. I'm proud of you. 
and, and, and just really, really share that with your kids. Um, and then this last one is important to me. Um, you know, we, remember when we used to try to do like Bible studies with our kids? It was it was terrible. Family circle. Family circle, you know. <laughs> so we had like a 12-year-old, a 10-year-old, and a 6-year-old. The 6-year-old is fighting or farting. Uh, you know, the 10-year-old's like, he farted. And the 12-year-old's <laughs> like, this is so lame. <laughs> so I would not do, and I, this was, I, I, I just don't believe in like family Bible study. Here's what I believe. As an adult, you do the Bible study, f- figure out the verse, and then teach it to your kids. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, talk to your kids. And here's what I want my kids to know. I want my kids to know my faith in God is real. It's Mm -hmm. not something I do on Sundays. It's something Mm -hmm. that they Mm -hmm. see constantly in my life. And I think that's what the Shema, God, Jesus said is the most important commandment. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. And it talks about that our children, it it makes no mention of, of quoting scripture, memorizing scripture. It says, talk about my commands in the morning, in your coming, in your going, when you eat. And, you know, like when you walk. It's integrate your faith into life. And so let them know, look. And so when I speak to my son, son, here's what I think God wants for you. And if you use a verse, use a verse. But let God use that verse through you. And when you speak to your daughters, here's what I want for you. Here's what's best for you. I know Remind gonna, them about what's yeah. true about God. That's what we try to do over and over. Yeah. It's like, here's what we know is true about God. Yeah, because we live in a world where God is made fun of and, mm-hmm. and put down and it's made seem ridiculous. Yeah, it's, it's, it's made to seem ridiculous. And what's ridiculous to me is modern life. Nothing seems to work. Mm-hmm. But people who love God are happier and healthier. And, and Harvard, the atheist university, keeps wondering why that is. Huh, I don't know. So, Before we go into number three, I want to hit back to something you said right at the beginning, which was setting those goals. And that's something you and I did early on in our ministry, was say, at the end of all of this, what's the win? Is it that we're the biggest church on the planet that... Right. You know, everyone knows about what the work of Sandals Church is. And we had to come down to the win for us is that at the end of all of this, we're still married and we still love God and that our children know that God is real in their lives. Yeah. And and I think that is reflected in how you've outlined your goals today. So yeah. this next one is super important to both of us. Um, your third goal is one of the things that I think has been the most challenging yeah thing in our 25 years of ministry, which is navigating and managing relationships. Yeah. It's been our deepest wounding and our greatest joy. Can you speak to that goal? Yeah, I would just say uh, friendships are hard. Um, I think the world does not understand how to cultivate friendships. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we, we see it like, you know, from afar, but we don't experience it. And what I would just say is, I think the lie that the devil whispers in your ear is you're the only one without a friend. I think most people don't have a friend. And so here's one of the things that I've had to learn. Uh, I want to be a good friend. Mm -hmm. Why is that? I realized I wasn't. And I started to interact with pastors, people that if I said their names, you would know. You've listened to their Bible studies. They they could give you a five-point sermon on relationships. They are terrible people in relationships. And they're in their ivory towers. They're divorced from people. You know, we were at this thing, and, you know, Tammy's favorite pastor, I'm not going to say who it is, uh, but it's Craig Rochelle. Um, I couldn't meet him. Yeah, so she she told me, she's like, I don't want to meet him. So we were were in this small gathering, and there's like, I don't know, 30, 40 pastors in there. And I'm like, we're going to meet him. Like, there's one coffee bar. There's like five tables. And uh, she's like, you can't make me meet him. And I'm like, fine. Kid you not, first day, Craig Rochelle, hey, Matt, come have lunch with us. And she, she just took off. I need Craig Rochelle to be everything yeah. I believe he yeah. is. And, yeah. at, and to date, he's still that. Yeah. Yeah. And the truth is, uh, not that Craig is watching anything that I say, <laughs> but um, he, he, is, he, is, he is, is a good guy, and I think he has a healthy relationship. But I learned I wasn't a good friend. And, and this really became clear for me in my 40s, in my 40s, I realized. Um, I, I think especially as, if you're a strong personality, mm-hmm. you tend to tell people how to live, but you don't interact with them and live with them. And I realized that so much of my relationships became one directional. Uh, like my profession is weird. Like I'm talking to you and you're just, you're just listening. That does not happen anywhere else in life. You know, Turns out friends don't love that either. Yeah, friends don't love that either. You know, they're not, they're, my friends aren't like, point number three was what? Um, <laughs> So I realized I wasn't a good friend, and, and my loneliness was a result of my brokenness. And so I had to start mending that. 
uh, I found more and more successful people that I looked up to were more broken than I was relationally. And so preaching a good sermon is not the same as being in healthy relationships. So what I look for now is I look for good people that I enjoy being around. Um, you know, so many of you, you're looking at social media. Oh, I wish I was at that party. I, I wish I was there. I just want to be around good people that I enjoy. And um, life is hard enough. You don't need friends that make it harder. And so uh, I don't want friends that compete with me. I don't want friends that are jealous of me. I want friends that just, that just love me and, and care for me. And, and what I do is weird, but maybe what you do is weird. I don't know what you do. Um, so it's just weird. And, and, and listen to me, especially young people, the older you get and the more successful you become, the harder it is to get people to be normal around you. But I think that was hard for us to realize that people are one way around us and a completely different person around mm -hmm. others. And that's, that's kind of sad. Mm -hmm. so, so I surround myself with good people. Next, I, I, I find friends that I trust. Find people that are loyal to you. I think that's really, really important. Um, you should pursue friendships just like you pursued your, your husband or your wife. Mm -hmm. It's not easy. Um, and, and people that you minister to or work with are not necessarily your friends. Like people that work with you get paid to be around you. And people that you minister to, like you're caring for those, but they're not your peers. And so you have to have people that, you know, iron sharpens iron. Mm -hmm. People that are with you, find those people. Mm -hmm. And then I find, I, I just, this is me, I love to be around people that inspire me to be better. Mm -hmm. I don't like being around or enjoy being around people that want to tank their life. Um, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm really opposed to almost all drugs, drunkenness, you know, um, yeah, I don't know why I said almost all drugs. <laughs> all all I drugs. I mean, you're not against like Advil, yeah. so I, mean, I, I guess do, it works. I do take Advil. Um, <laughs> yeah. You might be on Dayquil now. So yeah, I might be on Dayquil like... today, but um, but I, I I don't know about you guys, but I like to be with people that inspire me mm -hmm. in every category. Uh, couples that inspire me to to love you more. Um, you know. Kids that inspire me, you know, to, to want to be a better dad. Uh, I just, I love. And in love, this season, a grandpa. Yeah, grandpa, we would love to be grandparents. Um, <laughs> no pressure at all, but a little. But so, if you see our girls, it's Yeah, cool. yeah. Um, so I mean, he just threw me off. Um, that's how. That's how much we're ready to be grandparents. That's all we think about right now. And then next, I think this is key, uh, especially the more successful you become. And you got you to listen to me on this. You have to have leaders that will challenge you if they think you're wrong. And one of the things I've learned, like Dan Zimbardi is one of the greatest leaders ever. And we had, so I, I had this program on my computer that if I looked at something that was like, uh, you know, you're going you're gonna to die. So like if it, if it was nudity, nudity at all, it would email Dan, our executive pastor, and tell him that I was looking at that. So I go in his office, he's being all weird. And I'm like, just say it. What, what is going on? And he's like, well, there's some things on your computer this week that I, I'm just embarrassed to talk to you about. And I'm like, what? So I go and look at my computer. She was on my computer shopping for stuff. And I'm like, you, I, you look for women's stuff on your computer, not on my computer. But what I, but what I realized was you know, Dan is one of the strongest people I know. It was so hard for him because I'm his boss, you know? And, uh, you know, I'm not in trouble. You're in trouble, you know? And I could have fired him or something like that. So you, you have to just surround your people that love you enough to say, hey, I didn't, I didn't like that. Or I, I know that, you know, I know that you don't mean that about Tammy. I know that, you know, I, I didn't like the way you interacted with your kids. There, there are some senior pastors uh, in America that, Man, I can call and I can just vent and blow. And uh, one of my favorite pastors, Chip Henderson, it's one of the largest churches in America. He's from Mississippi. Now Matt, now Matt, you don't you don't want to be that way. Um, Thank and, you, and Chip. It, Chip, if you're watching, I, I know your accent isn't that bad, but um, <laughs> but you know I, I love him. And you just who's that person that you can call when you're ready to jump off the cliff or push somebody off a cliff? Your next goal initially surprised me because I just know you to be such a driven person, right. so goal-oriented. You're a three on the Enneagram, success, 
is the pinnacle. So it really caught me at first to see this as your for fourth goal. Right. Can you talk about the goal of success and how it's been key to yeah. being where we are 25 yeah. years later? So I would say when I was my most, most unhealthy, at, at, I was the unhealthiest in my life, mm -hmm. this would have been number one. And I was miserable. And so many young people I see today, their number one goal is to be famous and be a, to be an influencer. And I would just say, for what and why? What do you want to be famous for? And, and, and so many young people don't care. They just want views. So they'll compromise their faith, their integrity, their life. And um, I just think this is such a, if this is your number one, I'd really challenge you to pray about it. I don't want to be in my third marriage, my fourth marriage. That's not what I want. What I want is to build a life for God with Tammy. So what that means is my professional goals cannot be one, two, or three. Because people that are like that are deeply broken people. M most of the successful people in our lives that change our lives for the better have terrible lives at home. So, and, and, and for all of you who are wanting to raise, you know, rise on your platform, rise in influence, just know there's a cost. And you have to ask yourself, I'm, I'm willing to pay this. You want the platform, but do you, do you want to take the punishment? And what I would say is you only want to go as high as God's called you because that's all that you can take. Mm -hmm. And if you think you're called to more than you are, you're going to be miserable because you're, you're never going to live up to what you think you could do. Mm -hmm. um, so, so for me, professional goals is number four. And, so, and this is just point blank. And you may not like this or agree with it. I, I don't care. I don't care what you think. Um, Tell us how you really feel. Yeah, I, want to, I want to build a great church numerically. And I can't stand people that say you're all about numbers. God has a book in the Bible called Numbers. I know, you haven't read your Bible. It's in there, numbers, <laughs> right? God cares about numbers. People matter. And, and, and so many of you, you know, you're so discouraged politically, it's because you need to start counting in the church numerically. We need big churches, vibrant churches, healthy churches, growing churches, churches that are taking ground, changing souls, changing lives. And I'm not gonna apologize for that. Like people are, well, how big do you want your church to be? Well, until there's no more lost people. That's how big. Mm. Amen? Amen? So that's just me. So, um, so I want to build a great church numerically. I want to build a great team internally. So one of the things that makes Sandals unique is our team. We have an incredible, incredible team. And I can trust them to make decisions. Uh, oftentimes, like last night when we were, we were uh, leaving our, our dinner date together, I'm just on the phone checking in with our executive team, listening to the decisions they made. If you want to be great in life, you cannot be a solo star. Mm -hmm. You know, just ask LeBron James. Lakers suck. <laughs> okay? Sorry, Fredo. <laughs> yeah, they do. Fredo knows. They, everyone knows. <laughs> you know, um, because you, you have to have a good team. And you have to be able to empower others and, and, and share, share not just the responsibility, but share the glory. Mm -hmm. And so Sandals is a culmination of a great team. Absolutely. We have strong leaders, powerful leaders. And man, if you want to be successful in life, you better have a great team. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, Jesus, you know, picked 12, got 11 of them right. Amen? You know, <laughs> he, he had a miss with Judas. Um, and I've had my fair share of Judas's. So... Just, just build a great team. Next, um, I want to have a healthy church family. Mm -hmm. We don't want to build a great church on the backs of broken marriages. Mm -hmm. One of the things I'm most proud of uh, over the years at Sandals Church is how little of our, our, our ministry couples have divorced. I, so I don't even know. I'm going to say hundreds of people have worked in ministry for us for 25 years, mm -hmm. handful of divorces, mm -hmm. handful. Okay, and, and those did not happen while they were here, in most cases, because we pour into them, we, we, we care for them. Just last night, I was on the phone with, with, with a staff member who's struggling in his marriage, and I just said, just know, I love you, and I love your wife, and I'm praying for you, mm -hmm. because as soon as I hear there's marital problems, the marriage becomes number one. The ministry they do is secondary every single time, um, mm -hmm. and so I, I want to have a healthy church family. And so one of the things that people notice when they interview here is, and they say this, surprise, what, people like each other here. I'm like, why would, you, why would you want to work somewhere where people don't like each other? And these are, we're interviewing church people. That's what's scary. 
you know. Um, so, so we like each other and we enjoy hanging out. We enjoy each other. And, and, and that's just, you know, one of the, the beautiful things about Sandals Church. And people who don't, aren't enjoyable don't last very long here. So because we have a great culture, we have a healthy culture, we actually care about each other. It's one of the things I'm most proud of. Mm-hmm. Um, and then next, and this is huge, I want to lead people who want to be led. Like, I know, some of you are like, what does that mean? Pray about it. So uh, you cannot lead someone that does not want to be led. Life is too precious. You know, uh, Jesus said, do not cast pearls before swine, lest they trample you. And so many of you guys, the reason you're not having impact in your life that you want is you're talking to the people who don't want to listen. Mm -hmm. Who are the people in your life that want to listen, who are desperate for God, who are ready to change? Pour into them. Pour into them. Because there are people who are lonely and hurting and have questions. There there are married couples that want to change, want to heal, want to grow. There are teenagers who desperately want God. Focus on them. Focus on them. One of the things that Jesus did that I think Christians struggle with is he let people go. He let people walk away. He didn't chase them. You say, what about the prodigal son? The prodigal son came back. The prodigal son came back. So I think that's one of the things that you and I, in hindsight, wish we had oh, been better at, yeah. is letting people walk away. Oh, so dumb. Um, and now we know. You don't know what you don't know. Yeah. Um, Matt, one of the things that I think surprises people who don't know you super well right. um, is just how much you love learning. Yeah. The people closest to you know that you know a lot of random things. I know. You study constantly. You're constantly learning. It's one of the things that I actually admire about you so much as my best friend. You care so much about learning. Can you talk to why intellectual goals is such an important goal for you? Yeah, I mean, I think when, when you truly surrender to Christ, the first thing you realize is you don't know much. And guys, you have a limited time. Mm. And so use your brains. Keep growing keep learning. I, I think it's so important. Um, and, and, and so much of the conflict we have in our culture today is because kids don't know anything. And it's not because they don't care. It's because we haven't taught them anything. Mm. And so um, I'm fascinated by language, culture, philosophy, uh, mm-hmm. science. I'm fascinated by all of these things. It's part of loving God with your mind. Mm-hmm. And, and I just want you to know, just be aware of what you don't know and be curious. I, I want to grow my mind. And, and here's the thing that I, I learned probably about 20 years ago, is I can't control how smart I am, but I can control what I try to learn. Mm -hmm. And so um, we all have limits on what we can learn, and and some things are harder for us than others. But be curious Mm -hmm. and, um, and and just keep growing. One of the things that breaks my heart is when people think Christians are stupid. You know, well, God said it, that settles it. Well, okay, not for most people. So, so try to grow, try to learn. And, and just keep expanding your mind. God's not done with your mind until you're dead. Keep growing. This next one has been a sore subject in our marriage because sometimes I feel like it's a little too important to you, um, which is your physical fitness routine, dedication, right. devotion, obsession. Addiction. Can yeah. you speak to? Um, however, I do appreciate yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Can you speak to the importance of having physical goals? Yeah, yeah. So I learned in my mid-30s, and, and some of you who are young, you're like, oh, what's he talking about? It's coming. Um, I only feel as good as my body is fit. So I learned in my 30s there's a connection between my anxiety, depression, and physical fitness. Physical fitness was something I just took for granted early on. And so here's what I would say. No matter how old you are, the more stress you have in life, the harder you need to work out. So if your job is stressful, you don't need to go home, sit on the couch, pound a pint of ice cream. You need to pound out that aggression in the gym, walking, getting outside. Uh, And so there's a connection between your body, uh, your physical health, and your spiritual life. If you don't feel well physically, you're not going to feel God spiritually. So try, try to exercise and stay in shape. I'm not saying you have to be, you know, an addict like I am. Um, Because the goal isn't just for what you look like. It's how you feel, how you think. Yeah, absolutely. And and, I mean, that changes. I mean, the harder I work out now, it just doesn't even make a difference. Everything's (laughs) falling apart. Um, But here's the thing is, I do what I have to do so that I can enjoy what I like to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So if you're making noises when you're getting up and getting down, yeah! that's, we're starting that's to the do. gym. That's the gym calling you. So I think this last goal is so interesting because it's one of the things when we were dating and you said, I'm going into ministry and you need to know what that means for us financially. We are never going to be um, well off. We're never going to be rich. We're probably going to be really poor and you need to go into this knowing that. And yet God has been so good to us through your, you being so diligent in having financial goals. Yeah. So can you speak to the value of financial goals? Yeah. I think one of the things Christians do naively is say, well, God's in charge. Well, he's put you in charge. So when it comes to your finances, you need to honor God with your finances. And that means get your financial life in order. Um, and so here's, here's my financial goal. I want to make enough money for myself and my family so that I can be generous to my church I can be generous to my family, and I can be generous to people. Um, I don't care about being uber rich. I know some uber rich people, and their lives are not what I want. Uh, because remember, you know, professional, that's their number one, and that, that doesn't end well. But you do need money to survive. You just do. And for those of you who don't understand that, we have to work to support you. So I need you to wake up to the fact that you need to do something with your life. But so much misery in Christians' lives is because of financial insanity. You're like, God bless this. He's like, think about it, you know? So, so make sure that you are just saying, God, I want to cultivate a wise financial, uh, you know, portfolio. I want to be smart with my money. And nobody knows what the, what the future is going to be. Nobody knows what's going to happen in 2023, but you can be smart with the money you have. And so quit asking God to bless you with money you don't have and start asking God to give you the wisdom to be a blessing with the money you do have. That's and that's so the key. That's so good. Before you close in prayer, I just want to take a moment to thank you, Sandals Church. Thank you for your kindness and love to me, Matt, and our family. Thank you for your patience and grace as we've grown up alongside of you. I was 23 when we started this church. I had a lot of growing up and maturing to do. Um, thank you to those who were here in those early days when we were figuring it out. Thank you to those of you who were there then and are still now, yeah. it's so special to us. And thank you to those of you who are on this leg of the journey with us. It is our life's joy to follow Jesus together with you guys. Yeah, amen. I just wanna say thank you guys, I love you. We were kids when we started and mm -hmm. um, we're not kids now. But let me just encourage you, this isn't about, our, our, this isn't about me and Tammy's story, mm -hmm. this is about our story. Yes. And we're all a part of this and we need to be together more now than ever. Uh, the world is not for the church. The world is against the church. Satan is trying to tear down this church every single day. We need to be diligent to protect this beautiful blessing that we've been given. Sandals is a blessing. San if some of you don't believe in miracles, you're in a miracle right now. <laughs> Sandals Church yes. is a miracle. And uh, Tammy and I just wanna say thank you so much. And so would you just bow your heads and close your eyes. And I'm gonna pray for the next 25 years. Heavenly Father, thank you for 25 years. Lord, give us I pray that in the next 25 years, God, you just blow our minds. God, we pray for us as a church, protect us as a church. And God, we pray that you would be working in the hearts of the next pastor of this church. God, I pray that you would be putting people around him to grow him up, to direct him and to lead him, to take over this beautiful thing that you've grown, this miracle called Sandals Church. God, I pray that every person would be convicted today to know that they're an essential part of what we do, to start serving, and to be a part and just to watch what you're going to do in the next 25 years. So thank you, Lord Jesus. We love you and thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hi, thank you so much for watching. If this material is helping you to further your authentic relationship with Jesus Christ, I want to encourage you to move from being someone who watches content to someone who participates and helps give towards this content. I want you to know that no amount is too small. Jesus Christ himself makes the biggest deal out of the smallest gift. And so whether that's $1 or $5 or $10, every dollar helps us in our mission to reaching the world with this vision of authenticity. So if God is prompting you, if the Holy Spirit is moving you towards generosity to Sandals Church, I want to encourage you to go to donate.sc. And here's all we ask. Give whatever God asks you to give. And we will just pray over that and ask God to bless that so that we can reach more people like you with this life-changing message.